The history of Russian jewellery art is over 2,000 years old. It's gone through periods of prosperity and oblivion. In this film, we'll tell the story of the remarkable but often complicated development of Russian jewellery. This is the Fabergé Museum in St. Petersburg. It houses the largest collection of Fabergé's exquisite pieces in the world. Now, if I said to you Russian jewellery art, you'd probably think of Fabergé. But he was just a part of it. Historically, this territory of modern Russia was inhabited by a great variety of tribes and ethnic groups. In the 8th century BC, the Scythians began to settle in the southern part of Russia. They left behind them a significant legacy of applied arts, creating in jewellery design the so-called animal style. But the Scythians had very high standards of beauty. They were always at war with other tribes, and they believed that what was beautiful would bring them victory. So exquisite images of animals, especially predators, but also those which represented strength, were a common feature of Scythian art. Scythian jewellery art developed over several centuries. Their techniques and materials might change during that time, but their technical craftsmanship and a strong, sophisticated artistic conception was never compromised. It's probably why Scythian jewellery had such a wide influence on jewellery making, not only in Russia, but across the known world. Even today, the sacred animal figures created by the Scythians are echoed in the work of contemporary jewellery designers, you could say, keeping the skill and the art of those ancient people alive. In the 9th century AD, the unification of the tribes and the establishment of the state, Kievskaya Rus, began to take place in the lands of ancient Russia. Works of Russian jewellers from this period are characterised by the rich variety of designs, for example, Novgorod city craftsmen of the 11th century were famous for their very beautiful silver liturgical vessels and embossed icon frames. Later, in the 12th and 13th centuries, Vladimir and Susdal jewelers started to use the combination of silver and gold in the same items. When speaking about ancient Russian art, we traditionally divide it into a number of periods. The first period of ancient Russian art, including jewelry art, is the period before the Mongol invasion, starting from the adoption of Christianity by the Byzantine Empire until the beginning of the Mongol invasion. What was the most typical for that period? Undoubtedly, all kind of Byzantine influences, as the Slavic culture was influenced by the Christian iconography. In the 16th century, Moscow became the center of the United Russia and the place that set the fashion for jewelry craftsmanship. Jewelry art developed especially in the fabrication of commission jewelry for the ruling elite, czars, princes, and boyars. Another important area was religious artifacts and related objects of religious cult, which clearly showed the influence of Byzantine art. On the other hand, with regard to the 17th century, we can already talk about European influences. But of course, the era of Peter the Great was a turning point for Russia in this respect. In 1703, Tsar Peter the Great founded St. Petersburg here. It was his plan to build a new European capital city on the territory which Russia had just conquered. And this land also gave the Russians access to the Baltic Sea. An ardent reformer, Peter the Great modernized Russia using the best of Western influences. In building St. Petersburg, he literally opened a window to Europe. His changes to the conservative and somewhat closed Russia at that time were felt in all spheres of state and society, and they affected the cultural life of the country too, including the jewellery art. Russian craftsmen began to travel extensively in Europe to study the Western experience and to introduce the works of Russian jewellers to European connoisseurs. In 1842, Gustave Fabergé founded a jewellery firm in St. Petersburg. 
which was later run by his son, Peter Karl Fabergé, whose name is linked to the blossoming era of Russian jewelry art. Peter Karl Fabergé was born in St. Petersburg on May the 30th, 1846. In his youth, he traveled around Europe and studied art in Dresden. Later, he began learning jewelry craftsmanship from Joseph Friedman in Frankfurt. On his return to St. Petersburg, Karl Fabergé started to run his father's jewelry company, which at that time was not among the most prominent of jewelry workshops. From the very start, he set a new objective for his firm, to focus on unique jewelry matching the taste of the Russian aristocracy. Fabergé's work is in a tradition where the craftsmanship and the skill and the expression is key. The, the value of the materials are almost irrelevant to Fabergé, and I think this is a very important part of his work. And in fact, in Britain, uh, his lawyer describes the, the precious materials in Fabergé's work as merely being the foundation of it. And there was a great analogy that if you were to value Fabergé's work on the basis of, the, of its component materials, it would be like valuing the contents of the National Gallery as a collection of just canvas. The materials are almost irrelevant. It's the artistic expression of the materials that's key in Fabergé's work. In 1882, at the National Art and Industry Exhibition in Moscow, his creations attracted the attention of the Emperor Alexander III. Fabergé won the patronage of the royal family and the title of His Imperial Majesty's Jeweler and Jeweler of the Imperial Hermitage. Undoubtedly, what made his reputation was his series of Easter eggs. Fabergé is a very elegant and a very restrained form of jewellery, and I think there is a sense that the people who were buying it were also equally elegant and restrained. And again, part of that was that there was a focus on understatement. They wished to express their connoisseurship and their patronage through these very delicate and beautifully assembled works of art, which were in the form of jewels. Carl Fabergé and jewelers from his firm created the first jewelry egg in 1885. It was ordered by Tsar Alexander III as an Easter surprise for his wife, Maria Fyodorovna. Fabergé was ordered to produce an egg every year. The next emperor, Nicholas II, kept this tradition going. Each egg took almost a year to make. The Imperial Egg series became so famous that the Fabergé firm undertook orders for private customers, noble families of the time. But despite the generally recognized superb level of Fabergé craftsmanship, the artistic value of many of his works was questioned by some critics and art historians. In Europe, in Paris and in other places, around 1900, it was Art Nouveau, it was Jugendstil. But you do not find any or only very, very little uh, Jugendstil objects in the work of Fabergé. So he was not a real modern. Anyway, Fabergé works undoubtedly showed a supreme quality of craftsmanship, which would be difficult to replicate even now. In Paris in 1900, Fabergé was awarded the title of Master of the Paris Guild of Jewelers and the Order of the Légion d'Honneur. And what impressed the French uh, jewelry particularly were the settings of the jewels that Fabergé exhibited. Uh, they considered that the quality of workmanship of Fabergé's jewelers, this was in particular a man called Albert Holmström, 
uh, were better than the things that contemporary French jewelers were made. So they thought that Fabergé was in advance of their own jewelers at that time. In the same year, the headquarters of the Fabergé company was built in the center of St. Petersburg. Fabergé branch offices were also opened in Moscow and Odessa. It was truly a time of the greatest prosperity and international recognition of Russian jewelry art. But there was a serious shock awaiting the country, one which took its toll on jewelry art as well. In October 1917, the Soviet government, led by the Bolsheviks, came to power in Russia. Under the pretext of returning power to the people, any private business was made illegal, and all factories were nationalized, with irrevocable confiscation of all property and wealth. Fabergé ordered the halt of production in July 1918, only when the news of the assassination of Emperor Nicholas Alexandrovich and his entire family reached St. Petersburg. Inspiration died, and for many Russians, it was time to leave. ideology of the Soviet state, jewellery art was rejected as bourgeois, and manufacturers and jewellers were persecuted. Unaware of the high artistic value of the now nationalized jewellery, the Bolsheviks sent a great number of items to be melted down. It was only due to the efforts of Western connoisseurs of the time that many outstanding works were preserved. And when the agents of the Bolshevik government came to London, they met with Watsky. And then there was a chap called Emmanuel Snowman who was working at Watsky. And he was quite a dynamic and capable individual. And he spoke Russian, which was a, a great advantage to these transactions. And he began to deal with the Russian agents in purchasing the confiscated treasures. For many years, the events that shocked the country stopped the development of Russian jewelry art. The Civil War, deep economic crisis, and finally the Second World War that followed the revolution did not contribute to the renaissance of jewelry making. It was only in the early 1950s that the first large jewelry factories began to appear in the Soviet Union. In line with general trends of industrialization, these were real factories, and jewelry became just a part of industry. The reopened factories made mainly household items, Soviet regalia, and mass market products with little artistic value. Naturally, items of jewelry created at that time can't be compared with the great works of the past. Behind me is Vera Mukhina's statue, Worker and Kolkut's Woman. 
It was first exhibited at the Paris Expo in 1937. In 1939, it was moved to Moscow. Worker and Kolkut's woman was the standard of socialist realism, which engulfed all kinds of official art in Soviet Russia. The importance of the monument during the Soviet rule left no doubt that any other view of art in the country could not exist. Mudak. Moron. Each factory had its own so-called art committee that considered the sketches drawn by artists and decided which of them could be put into production and which of them not. All jewelry factories were obliged to submit the designs of new items for the consideration of such committees and were not allowed to start production without their approval. The determining role here belonged to the retail, and they used to say, this is in demand and this is not, we do not need it. And the work of the artist was in vain. They not only dictated the production volumes or the profit level, but also the assortment policy. For example, how many rings or earrings or necklaces were to be produced for the entire country during the next five years. It certainly sounds absurd, but that was the life. By the middle of the 1960s, a group of artists was established whose works laid the foundation for a new stage in the evolution of Russian jewelry art. Paradoxically, while remaining in the shadow of non-recognition and developing parallels with other forms of underground art, jewelry art found freedom of self-expression and exploration. They became the first generation of jewellery artists who considered their work not just as a profession, but as a true art. The perestroika that followed shortly afterwards and the weakening of the Iron Curtain offered more and more opportunities for the works of the new generation of Russian jewellery artists to be introduced to and recognised by Western experts. The renaissance of Russian jewellery art cannot be separated from the names of Gennady and Natalia Bikov, jewellery artists from St. Petersburg. Having started their career in the mid-1970s, the Bikovs have become initiators and regular participants in parallel avant-garde art exhibitions that have appeared in the country. And from the very beginning, I was really fascinated by the quality, both the quality of design and the quality of crafts, uh, craftsmanship. Gennady Bikov and Natalia Bikova developed their own style, their own personal style, their own personality as artists, as jewelers. Gennady's jewelry, it's more rational. He thinks uh, about uh, the um, quality of uh, the structure of design he, as a person who uh, is absolutely uh, technically on the highest standard, uh, he can combine his creative ideas with the enormous technical possibilities he owns as a craftsman. Natural, more with Natalia's jewelry, 
And when I looked at her, the beautiful little brooches with houses or with trees or with water, with flowers and so on, I got the feeling there is a very deep understanding of the surroundings in our world. The question quite often is, what does it, what is it, what fascinates you? And then you have to go deeper. You have to try to understand the mentality of the artist. I do not think any writer or artist can explain what inspiration is. It's just hard work. Gennady and Natalia were working during the difficult period of Russian jewelry art. Despite being part of the Soviet jewelry industry, they were able to maintain and develop their own style in their works. Like every artist, Gennady and Natalia have some personal themes of creativity and sources of inspiration. That subject preoccupied me since 1961-62, bionics. Even as a child, you look at a blade of grass, it is thin and high. With such a ratio of diameter to height, it does not break in any wind. How is that so? How does nature do it? And that's how it starts. Thoughts, reflections. I've been always excited about the concept of time. Time. How does it flow? In what direction? And in this space, you can feel at a certain moment as small as a grain of sand. And then, all of a sudden, as large as the gear wheel of a big clock. And therefore, I was much interested in the mystery of time, how it flows, mechanics. As for myself, I, for instance, pick up the themes from the environment, some natural elements, and I consider that the most important thing is to have an idea. This is a starting point. First, an idea, an image, a form, then plastic and graphic solutions, then material, you need to know the material, to feel it. When you conceive a theme, you start to select the material, and the material should be used in such a way that there will be no signs that you have forced it. It should work itself, not necessarily precious. Any material requires a very respectful attitude. Also, I always wanted to show that there is art in anything. For example, just an ordinary stone. Not necessarily some expensive stuff. We can pick up any pebble stone from the road. And if we carefully examine it, we can see absolutely anything there. We should just be very attentive, that's it. And such is the concept, to avoid embellishment. In general, the same things are happening in the jewelry as they are in great art. Fabergé had the large house uh, and he had a workshop in uh, Moscow and uh, somewhere else. Totally different situations. But the quality of the Bikoff work is our style in, modern, in the modern world as and even more than uh, Fabergé's style was the style of his world. Russian jewellery has transformed the development of the national fine arts in general. It's become a truly significant feature of the world's cultural heritage, thanks to its great legacy from the past, the turbulent events of the 20th century, and now its exciting renaissance. More and more of the world's leading museums are including contemporary Russian art in their collections. However, that is a story that's only just begun.